Coming up on this week's show, a classic 90s movie gets a retro-style beat-em-up. KFC's new arcade machine is revealed. And we get the inside story of Soviet Strike with Flint Dilly. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our good mates of Bitmap Books who've just launched their brand new book, A Guide to Japanese Role-Playing Games. At 652 pages, it is their biggest one to date. So you can check that out and lots more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 282, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to our favourite bit of the week, just before the weekend, when hopefully you're getting ready to do a bit of relaxation and play a few old school video games across the weekend. And we update you on all the big happenings in the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last seven days. And we bring you a legend from the industry as well. Now, we have got an amazing guest that we'll tell you more about very soon. But I think it's fair to say the last seven days have been uh, slightly stressful for us after... (laughs) Oh, I've, I've been like show. Homer Simpson pulling out my hair, <laughs> getting stressed. <laughs> and um, we launched a survey last week, and uh, this was a listener survey, so we can kind of get the feedback. And then as soon as we launched the survey, the website went down, didn't it? And uh, it's kind of semi my fault. Um, I'd say mainly it's the host, but I had another account and I was migrating a domain off that account. And, you know, it's a separate package, but. Uh, the domain people decided to take us offline and then you know what it's like when you've got customer support and you ring them up and you're like can you fix this and they're just like reading off a script like yeah we were offline for about four days until we managed to get it back up what got me was just the oh wait 24 hours and then you rang them again oh wait 48 hours and then you were like rang them again they're like wait 72 hours and then you were just like right i'm gonna try and fix it myself (laughs) i'm gonna hack it i'm gonna (laughs) hack it back into life and i managed to so the result of this really is last week we we wanted to do this our first ever listener survey in five and a half years of doing this show to find out what you like about the podcast, what you want to hear more of, what kind of systems you want us to cover, what you like about the show. Really, you know, it'll take you about five minutes to do it, but we went quite in depth and really it's going to help us make this podcast better for you tailor it so it covers the subjects that you're into and also help us get more you know suitable advertisers for the show as well in the future um but yeah we launched the survey at midnight on friday and then the website went offline for four days at one minute past midnight so i did put it out to our patrons about two or three days early who uh, test drive it you know so but what it really means is because we do get 90 percent of our listens on a new show between friday and monday really only our patrons have filled it in Apart from a couple of people and, that have found and, it. And, so. you know, we had this an incentive as well, and it's um, yep. win £100, basically, because we were thinking, you know, there's so much retro gear. We wanted to pick something, and, and actually giving away £100 um, is is a much better way, because you can buy what you want. But the problem was, all these people then <laughs> wanted to find it and wanted to get on it, yep. and it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> available. So the patrons aren't going to get an advantage for having it first you know it's still going to be picked randomly from everybody that's entered the survey and how long is it running for dan as well well yeah we have launched the survey again now so it is on our website if you head to the retrohour.com we are going to extend it by a couple of weeks since nobody could access it over the last week so we're going to run this until the middle of august now and like ravi said i mean you go on there it'll take you five minutes to fill it in and everybody who fills in their details i mean you can do it anonymously if you want but if you want to leave your your name and email address we'll put you into a prize draw where you could win £100 in cash to spend on retro goodies of your choice. So again, I mean, like we were saying last week, it is really, really going to help us out. So we want as many people, like you said last week, Ravi, a survey is only as good as the amount of people that fill it in. So if the website we'll doesn't work. <laughs> no yeah, which, which was actually, so. no one filled it in so far. So uh, please, we're launching it again. You'll find it on our website right now. If you'd love to help out the show, that's a really easy way of doing it. TheRetroHour.com. Now we have got another belter of a show for you this week. An interview that you guys did that I've listened to already and I was blown away. I think this is one of my favourite interviews I've heard you guys ever do on this podcast. I I arranged it and I was like, let's get Joe on this one. And then Joe just shined. This is like Joe's, (laughs) oh God, seminal interview. Don't don't do that to me. (laughs) So I I only found out I was doing this interview about probably about 45 minutes before we did it. 
because I got, I got, I finished work early and Dan was like, it'd be really helpful if you could jump on this because you were in the middle of something, weren't you, Dan? And I was like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll jump on it. I'll jump on it, man. And I literally jumped on my computer five minutes before and started reading through the questions. And what an interview this turned out to be. Like this guy has worked on so many classic, we, we mainly, obviously we speak about games, you know, a lot of Sega CD games, a lot of PlayStation 1 games, a couple of N64 games and stuff. But this guy's legacy, I wish, you know, like he worked in film and cinema and in Hollywood and he wrote, you know, scripts and screenplays for like the Transformers movie, G.I. Joe, the TV show, the Transformers show, all this crazy stuff. And then we found out... Buck Rogers as well. Buck Rogers. And then his sister owned Dungeons and Dragons at one point, like... Just some crazy, crazy stories that we only managed to touch on for a couple of minutes for us to then end up talking about what we were kind of set out to talk about, which was, you know, the strike games, Soviet strike and nuclear strike, which was really, really interesting because they're such big legendary games, which I grew up with as well. You know, Soviet strike was the first ever game I had on the PlayStation 1. So for me, I went in there focused on that to then find out all this other amazing stuff. So we're hopefully going to get him on again to talk about some of the other stories because he even said didn't he we were on with him for about an hour and a half and he was like oh guys you only got to like 1995 and you missed so many <laughs> 80s things and we're just like you've you've worked on so much flint like we well, just can't you know, put it all he, in <laughs> he's like the ultimate 80s storyteller and yeah. uh he even did a lot of the fmv games and it's great to yeah. hear him you know come from kind of the movies and and story writing for them to then go into video games and i think you really enjoyed this because everyone usually just interviews him about transformers the movie exactly and there was also a part where we started talking to him spoiler alert we spoke to him about double switch the sega cd game and he thought we were going into night trap and he was like oh yeah i worked on night trap as well and we were like oh we've not even got any questions about night trap (laughs) See, that is the thing about doing like a, a one hour ish podcast, yeah. not a five hour one, isn't it? You know, sometimes you just got to focus on the core material. But when you get a guest like this, I mean, mm. I remember, you know, when Ravi got in touch last week and organized the interview, Ravi was so excited. He said, he's done this, he's done this. And we're looking and like, my God, it's like, this guy is like triple A, you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the amount of stuff he's worked on. But again, I mean, being a video games podcast, we like the other stuff, you know, Transformers and that. But really, this interview, you go in depth on uh, Soviet Strike Mm. and Nuclear Strike, that obviously were by Electronic Arts, follow-up to Desert Strike and Jungle Strike. You know, I love those games on the Amiga and the Mega Drive. But I think you're right. I mean, for me, Soviet Strike, an early PlayStation 1 game, I've actually got both of them in my hand here off my shelf. <laughs> Nuclear Strike still needs shrink wrap. <laughs> I haven't opened this one. But Soviet Strike has been very well played. Yeah, so like I say, Soviet Strike Christmas 95 for me. Yeah, but I think it, it is interesting because Soviet Strike was such a massive game and I know you guys in the interview kind of talk about how, you know, they had all these big plans for Nuclear Strike, but then some stuff went wrong with that that meant it didn't end up becoming as big a hit as a predecessor. Um, even though, you know, I've played it before, this is just a second-hand copy I got. Um, and they are incredible games. And really, it's a series that I'd love to see continue today, you know, like a proper HD follow-on or a remaster would be incredible. Yeah, it would be good. And we, and we do discuss it, you know, we discuss the legacy of it a little bit more. And Ravi asked us a couple of questions about a few of the games which were meant to be follow-ups and then kind of didn't and stuff like that but yeah it was a really really cool interview and i really hope you know we do get him back on again at some point and it won't be a case of we're out of guests we need to get somebody (laughs) somebody we spoke to before on it he's genuinely had that many stories and that many games and movies and stuff he worked on we just couldn't fit it all in we would have been there for about five hours i think but you are going to enjoy what you know what you you and ravi spoke about it's uh, and if you love those games so it's strike nuclear strike we go really in depth on that with flint dilly our special guest he'll be on the podcast in around 20 minutes from now now it's been a very busy week for retro gaming headlines Here's something I didn't think I'd see it on a news website. Uh, again, talking about FMV, a long-lost Atari Jaguar CD FMV game is now getting a release. You're a Jag expert, aren't you, uh, Dan? I know you collect for it. Like, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but yeah, I'm a fan. <laughs> what, what, the, a resident Jag expert. No, um, what, <laughs> what was the FMV capabilities like of the Jag? Yeah, well, I mean, there's only... On the Jaguar CD. It's like 11 games, isn't there? Th- there are 11 yeah. titles on there. Um, and there are, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, ones that have got, I mean, the stuff like Highlander has got some kind of, it's more like animated FMV. Mm. Um, but actually looking at this here, now this is a game that's called, 
um, which should have come out back in the mid nineties, I imagine. It's called American Hero. Yeah. Now. This looks like there is a trailer here, and this is a company called Ziggurat Interactive, who I think we've spoken about before. They did the um, remastered versions of the two Blood Rain games. So I think we spoke about that on the podcast a couple of years ago. So what they've done is, <laughs> you look at it, it kind of makes the acting in Night Trap look Oscar worthy. <laughs> you know, Jack's going to have less budget than the Sega CD, yeah. isn't it? Like we talked to Flint <laughs> about FMV, and he was saying, you know, half of these were converted onto TV and they were like that level of production where I think the JAG, JAG companies were a bit at a lower end. Yeah, I mean, you got stuff like, you know, Dragon's Lair and Mist also came out on the uh, Jaguar CD. So they did have some additional capabilities. And, you know, for the era, I thought the FMV capabilities of it were pretty decent. Um, but this, it looks like they've got a hold of the original material because it looks, you know, not quite high definition, but certainly a lot better than a mid-90s CD-based console could do. But they've restored it and actually got additional voiceovers by uh, an actor called Timothy Bottoms. And they're saying here that really they describe American Hero as a satire of over-the-top 80s action movies. So really, I think, you know, the, the aim of this was to make it originally a bit of a spoof, a bit cheesy. Which I think works better now than it would have done in the mid-90s. Because I think yeah. in the mid '90s, if it did come out when it was meant to come out in '93 or '94, I think it was, I think people would have seen it as like it is just a product of its time. Whereas, like you say, kind of reading the article, and it is meant to be that satire of the '80s, and I think you can see that more looking back at it from a modern point of view, if that makes sense. Whereas at the time, I don't think people would have got that. I know what you're saying. Yeah, they could have just thought, God, these actors are wooden. Yeah. <laughs> it, it looks like, you know, when they remake, like, movies now, they're like, the greatest 80s movie ever, and it's got that yeah. kind of style, and it's done in a retro style. This is what it looks like, but it's the genuine article. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, really they're saying it's one of those games that, you know, they know that it's crap, and that makes it <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> so people want to play it because of how bad it is. And is this coming out on the Sega CD, on the, Sega CD, on the uh, Jaguar CD then? No, it's not. So what they've done is they've actually got the original material and they're going to be releasing it for PCs and for the modern consoles oh, brilliant. as well. Yeah, so cool. you're going to better yeah. play it on your Xbox One and stuff this summer, apparently. And the plot of it as well, I mean, it is such a generic plot. Timothy Bottom's character, he plays a character called Jack. His aim is to stop the evil Kruger. It's actually played by uh, Daniel Roebuck, who is in Fugitive and Final Destination. Um, and he's trying to poison the Los Angeles water supply. So loads of shooting, um, lots of women in their underwear, for, for no reasons reason. we don't know why. Just, just, in just it. because, yeah. <laughs> um, and looking at it as well, I mean, they say in this article that I'll link up on their PC games, they say zero actual gameplay. Now, when, <laughs> when you watch the trailer, it doesn't really show you any of the game mechanics. It's just all the FMV bits. But having played FMV games of that era, I've got like, you know, is it Thunder in Paradise or Hulk Hogan? TV series that was on back in the mid nineties. Oh, I don't know about that one. God, I, I I used to go in to see my gran in the nursing home, and they'd just be sitting there watching Thunder in Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I remember of that. <laughs> I wonder what your gran thought of that. Um, but yeah, that was an FMV game that came out on the Philips CDI, and again, it was kind of like just all of these movie sections tied together, and you'd have to make a quick choice or maybe control an on-screen gun. So there wasn't much gameplay to it, really. It was more just the the novelty of having a movie on your on your console, I guess. So I wouldn't expect it to be an in depth story. I, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it's that much of a satire. There isn't even any gameplay. Just watch this crappy B yeah. movie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I love the fact that they're actually digging into the archives of unreleased Jaguar CD games now. You know, stuff that we never thought would see what the light a niche. Of day. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So uh, I'd be interested to see the sales figures on that one, but um, it is meant to be coming out on modern consoles and your PC this summer. We'll put a link to that story in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, something from the 90s that was a little bit more successful than uh, the Atari Jaguar CD, Space Jam. Now, of course, that was that was an amazing movie back in the day, kind of like Looney Tunes meets basketball, wasn't it? It yeah. was, you know, very funny movie. Me- meets real life. <laughs> so, yeah, we're... Um- we are getting a new Space Jam film this year, um, but yeah. we're not here to talk about a new film. We're here to talk about a new a new retro game. Um, so we are going to be getting um, Space Jam, A New Legacy, The Game, which is coming to PC and Xbox One on the 15th of July. It's pretty interesting. So obviously it's a Space Jam game, so you're going to be playing as Bugs Bunny and Lola Bunny and LeBron James, who's the 
basketball player, you know, the lead kind of character in the new film. But it's an arcade beat em up, like a 90s style arcade beat em up, which is really cool. And apparently, this, this kind of, so I, I didn't see anything about this, but about a year ago, uh, they did a vote. So, the actual, you know, Space Jam, a new legacy, they, on their website, they did a vote for people to kind of vote for what kind of game they wanted for the Space Jam game. Um, right. And, and the 90s inspired arcade beat em up was the number one pick so they've made it and it's going to be free to play on xbox one for game pass and then it's going to be i think after about a month or so they're just making it completely free to play um you know, for anybody on xbox one which i think is pretty cool like an advert for the movie really isn't it yeah it's pretty much going to be an advert for the movie but you know you're going to get all your achievements and everything like that i'll probably check it out because you know i'm a sucker for beat em ups um but it, interestingly it, they've really captured that 90s look it looks quite like the Simpsons game to me. Um, it looks a bit like a Day of the Tentacle to me, actually. Just some of the way that they've drawn the doors yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Well, if you look at this trailer, at the start of it, I agree, Ravi. That's the first thing I thought. You've got this kind of 3D rendered Bugs Bunny that looks like the remastered version of Day of the Tentacle. Then you get about halfway through and it goes into this kind of like Sega Mega Drive style. Yeah graphics so yeah there's both in there yeah no it does look cool and it's you know it's free player as well which which i love that proper takes me back to the 90s like the free player arcade cabinets so yeah i'm looking forward to it i mean i I, when i first saw it i thought it was going to be like the basketball game you know which we got on playstation one and and sega saturn of space jam it it um, passed me by uh space jam did i uh, shack fu was the big one I was a big Space Jam fan. I was, <laughs> and there was another one, uh, another game, MJ Chaos in the Windy City as well. Did you ever play that? The uh, title rings a bell. I, no, I don't know that one. I thought you were going to say Moonwalker, then the Michael Jackson game, <laughs> but no. No, this is Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't aware of that one. So it's kind of a Michael Jordan uh, platformer where he was like uh, kind of rendered on it, and you'd use the basketball as like a weapon. Oh, that's awesome. I've got to look that up. I didn't know that one. It sounds a bit like Soccer Kid or something, that. Where he's yeah, it kind of is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but well, what's interesting is um, you know, Warner Brothers have always kind of played on the nostalgia that we've got for Space Jam now. Because actually, if you haven't seen the first movie and you type this into your browser, spacejam.com slash 1996, the original website in all its HTML 1.0, GeoCities Glory, is actually still live there. I've heard that before. It comes up every couple of years on like, you know, news articles and stuff like it's still there and it's still up and running, isn't it? Because oh. everyone was worried because that's kind of been like, you know, the one of the oldest websites still active on the internet. And when the sequel got announced, everyone's like, oh, no, they're going to finally take it down. But actually they put the new one up and you can still access the old one on there as well. So obviously it's not just something they've left up there to kind of rot. They're obviously looking at this as a bit of a time capsule and, you know, preserving it, which I think is really cool. I think there's a renewed interest in that period of basketball. Um, it, I saw a great documentary called uh, The Last Dance, mm. which is on Netflix, and it's all about the Chicago Bulls in that period with with the team and uh, all the madness that went on as well. And uh, just really, like, I didn't know much about basketball. And then looking back at that, you realise how much you know and, like, Dennis Rodman and all the kind of crazy stuff that was going on. All the films they were getting into and everything. <laughs> but yeah, now this looks cool. I mean, maybe the three of us should play it online or something with it being free players. <laughs> Stream it. Yeah, that'd be fun, actually, especially if it's kind of like in that vein of the Simpsons arcade. You yeah. know, we all love that kind of gameplay anyway. Can't beat that like retro size crawling and beat them up. So look forward to that. Should be available very soon to uh, Xbox Game Pass holders and then to everybody else next month. Now, we have talked, actually, last week, we are talking about the Simpsons Arcade, and I said, you know, get my garage converted. If I could have any arcade machine in there, that would probably be the one. My mind may be slightly changed by this next story, though. <laughs> what about having a KFC-branded arcade machine in the corner of your room? The KFC Hot Winger 64. Now, <laughs> if you are to get this in your converted garage, i am I'm got to be the bearer of bad news. There is only two of these being made, Dan. But this... It looks so I, bet, I bet it stinks as well. Your whole garage would stink of chicken. <laughs> this look, this is just like for me. Like obviously, I live and breathe retro. The, all three of us do, but this is so random and so strange. But like, it's so like head turning as well. So from what I understand, KFC are holding a gaming tournament mm. um, over the next couple of weeks. Now, one, 
there's 16 gamers. This is the actual like proper tournament, which people can go like watch and stuff. And there's going to be 16 contestants who have already been selected, you know, from winning previous competitions and stuff like that, who are going to be playing various different games against each other. Um, they're going to be playing Tetris and Space Invaders, Space Invaders Extreme um, and a couple of other games and a mystery game. So it's all very retro. And then the winner of that will win $10,000, uh, sorry, £10,000 and the KFC Hot Winger 64 arcade cabinet, which is a fully working, fully functioning, stand-up, full-size KFC arcade cabinet, which looks very similar to the Neo the SNK Neo Geo kind of cabinets to me. Yeah. But yeah, it, it looks like it's a Pandora's box in there and it, you know, it's fully functioning two player, but yeah, it's KFC themed. Um, and then the second one is going to go out to online contestants. So if you want to play, if you want to get involved, anybody can just like sign up to it and get involved. Um, and then whoever wins that will win the second Hot Winger 64 cabinet. So imagine if you entered it and you won it, Dan, and then you got that sent to you. As, <laughs> you as a vegetarian. <laughs> as a vegetarian as well. And this is against gaming elites by the sound of it. I've got no chance of ever getting <laughs> past these guys. Oh, but I love, I love the look of this as well, because uh, let me describe this then. It's an arcade stand-up unit, full size, in KFC red, yeah, it's got the stripes down the side. It's got the kernel on the front of it. <laughs> KFC gaming written underneath, and then there are like fried chicken wings and stuff on the side of it, and a Hot Winger sixty four um, written in kind of a, a retro kind of eight bit font, and like you know KFC bucket underneath smiling. Have you seen what's written across the control panel? It's finger clicking good. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> this is this is mad because uh, they that we I think we even covered it. There was a KFC console that was announced. Yes, a few yeah. years ago. But and yeah, the KFC console was last year, which I think was the same tournament. I want to say, and I think that might have been the prize for that about a year ago. I could be wrong. Um, Didn't that have like a, a chicken chamber that would keep your chicken hot while you're playing games? <laughs> well, it renders. <laughs> yeah it's so random but it's got us talking about it you know it's yeah, definitely you know, people yeah. talking about it i i saw a whole craze years ago which was people making mountain dew pcs so they'd make a mountain dew themed kind of pc but also if you think about it like wasn't there a coca-cola version of the game gear as there well? was yeah with the coca-cola kid as the game so, yeah, so there's you know, some fast the, food. There's some connection. It's not, weird. Yeah, it's games, not the first yeah. time things like this have had happened. But the Coca-Cola Game Gear was a much wider release. You know, I think there was quite a few thousand of them. I mean, I could be wrong. There might have only been a couple of them, but I know people have them. Whereas this is just like they're just making, and that you know, that was of the time Game Gear was out at the time. Whereas this is like, oh, here's this a retro is, yeah. arcade cabinet. You but know, they're getting news for retro. it, aren't they? they yeah, they're, they're getting they're news getting for it. Absolutely. So, yeah. So it's not a KFC PS5, but it's a KFC arcade cabinet to play. You know, by the sounds of it, it's loaded up with retro games and it is playable as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's complete. It's got Pandora's box in there. But I look things in the picture. Pandora's box five. Like loads of hacked ROMs, (laughs) which is just yeah, loads of hacked ROMs, which will probably have about a thousand arcade games on there from like the early eighties to the mid nineties. So you know, pretty cool to have in your garage. Uh, and play with sticky fingers. <laughs> yeah, you need you need to use those lemon wipes before you go on Because <laughs> that was my concern. It's like they're only making two of these, and obviously that means in the future it's going to be a collector's item. But to actually want this, I imagine you've got to be a KFC super fan. So you're probably going to have a, a bucket of chicken wings or something next to you while you play <laughs> and probably going to get a bit grubby you, after a you few You need the sit-down version and you sit on an upturned bucket. That will be the uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> with a KFC bucket on your head with cut out eyes. <laughs> you know what it should have. You know, some arcade machines sit down once have like a, a drinks holder that needs a, a, bucket a family holder. bucket holder. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's always interesting to see the companies that are, are using retro games to get the headlines. But I do think that is very cool. Uh, what about this then? Something that you didn't think you'd see in a charity shop or a, a thrift store, as they call them in America. A very rare. Atari 2600 game has been found in a Goodwill and has earned more than $10,000 at auction. Now, this is a really weird game. It was a game called Air Raid, and we've been looking this up, and there is a thread on Atari Age, two separate ones that in total run for over 35 pages. But it turns out there's only been 13 known copies of this game found over the last 40 years. Well, it's interesting because it's actually programmed by uh, Gary Kitchen. As well, who we had on uh, last week. Oh, so really? We, yeah, we could have asked him. 
<laughs> Damn, now you mi- missed an opportunity there. But um, this, Get it back on. yeah, this is a, an amazing car. It's it's got this kind of massive plunger on the top, and we've we've seen news about this previously because uh, one of them sold for a ridiculous amount of money. But amazing that this was found in a charity shop. It's it's by a, a, a couple um, called Menavision. And uh, I've just been looking at, like, the kind of history of Menavision, and it seemed like it was a couple that had their fingers in many pies. They had a, a couple of stores, and uh, Mena, Mena Sports Goods were one, uh, Mena Toys and Mena Jewelry. So I guess Menavision was, like, part of the Mena brand. and uh, Probably after, like, Activision or something, I guess. Yeah, or television. And they, they must yeah. have got Gary to program this, and uh, maybe, maybe he... He's got a copy. <laughs> Who knows? We need to get in touch with him again and ask about this because, yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of heard about this weird game before. Apparently the, the gameplay is not very good, but because the, there are so few of them out there, like I said, only 13 copies, and I believe around 10 of them have been found over the last decade. And you're right, the fact the cartridge, I think, is the most unique thing about this. It's actually a blue cartridge, and then on top of it, you've kind of got like a, a handle. Like it looks, it looks like, a, like plunger. a plunger. Yeah, t- yeah, like yeah, a dynamite a plunger. <laughs> like a little spade or something. But yeah, I wonder why they did that. Was that just to get the car in there? <laughs> it seems shrouded by mystery. I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm going to link up the Atari Edge threads if people want to read through them. <laughs> I must admit, we didn't have a spare three or four hours before we recorded the show to have a look through that entire thread. Looks like there's a lot of information already out there about it. And obviously, we're in touch with Gary, so um, it might be worth us dropping him a line to kind of see what he remembers about working on this, because um, it's kind of news to us that we just found out today that actually he worked on this game. But yeah, very, very interesting that, you know, they'd actually go to the effort of making a game. And from what I can see, it's the only game that Menavision ever released, you know, obviously in limited numbers. And it seems like, you know, collectors have actually made a dump of this. So you can play it online on Atari emulators as well, uh, which is pretty cool. It's for the 2600 and yeah, just looks really rare. And the fact that you can find something like this in a charity shop, I guess in America, you know, there's these thrift stores, aren't they? And uh, if you could find E.T. games in a desert, then you're going to be able to find this in a thrift store. And I think it's quite good as well that it was Goodwill who did the auction, um, so they've earned $33,000. Yeah, that they so spot, go spotted it themselves, I guess, yeah. uh, rather than some, some bloke like us turn up and go, oh, score, have that and put it put it on your shelf for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, Which I'm sure the, the person who bought it probably has. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> but at least, like you say, it's gone to charity and stuff. Yeah, apparently it's going to help out 20 homeless people and um, 10 at-risk kids as well with that money. So, you know, really good cause. So, uh, very cool. I mean, I've never found anything. I mean, God, I can't even find a copy of FIFA 2005 in charity shops around here anymore. Mate, I've got tons. (laughs) Tons I was going to say, it's Ravi sweeping through them all. (laughs) (laughs) A mountain of old FIFAs on a shelf behind them. (laughs) Now, before we get to our chat with Flint Dilly talking about Soviet strike, nuclear strike, all those classic games and lots more as well. Um, just quickly, something I want to mention as well about um, a game that was just everywhere when I was a kid. All my mates just suddenly got Sega Master System 2s. In fact, I think I've mentioned it before. My friend Dougie, who got one for Christmas in around 1990, and his mum didn't get many games with it. And the only game we played over and over again was Alex Kidd in Miracle World. And I think for many kids who had a Master System 2, probably one of those games they could play with their eyes closed. What was that? Was that only regional? Because like it was built in, built into the mm. Master System too. But was another game built into another region? Maybe. I think some of the later ones had Sonic. Yeah, some of the later ones had Sonic, but I don't, I don't know about the regions. Um, mm. But yeah, I remember playing. My friend had a, a Master System too, and me and my brother, being naive, always thought it was the sequel to the Mega Drive because we had a Mega Drive and they had the Master System too, and we were amazed. Right that Alex Kidd was built into it. <laughs> and he was like one of the early, early mascots as well, wasn't he? Was. he really? Yeah, Sega, yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah, he was kind of like, you know, the pre-Sega mascot before Sonic came along. Um, 1987, the game came out originally. Great platformer, you know, definitely one of the best on the system. But now it's had a lovely HD upgrade that came out this month. Um, just come out in the UK this week at the time of recording and is available for PC, Xbox One, Switch and PS4. I mean, I'm looking at this straight away and I'm thinking, I'm downloading this, this on the Switch to like, you know, games like this feel so at home on the Switch to me. But they've given it such a lovely 
graphical upgrade and the first thing you're going to notice on here. It does look beautiful. I mean, you, you said it's, oh, it's just a HD remaster earlier on when we were talking about it, but there's more in it. Th- there is more to it. It does look like, you know, they've completely rebuilt the game. I mean, I could be wrong, but to me, from watching the trailer, the game looks a lot smoother. The controls look a lot smoother. You know, you, you, don't get me wrong. We're all nostalgic for Alex Kid, but you know, when you go back and play it, it is a bit stiff. This doesn't look stiff. This this looks really smooth, really, really modern, really playable. So yeah, this looks a lot cooler than I thought it'd be, to be perfectly honest. Because when I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, Alex Kid. You know, I probably won't pick this up. But now I'm looking at it I'm like, okay, maybe I will pick it up. <laughs> Well, this is what, yeah, like you said, yeah, it's a recreation, really, mm-hmm. not just a straight HD port. Um, so they've improved, improved the controls that you said is often a complaint about the original game. Yeah. Um, there's new levels in here as well. Oh, okay. yeah. um, and they've got new boss fights. They've changed some of the boss fight mechanics in here, too. What is good, though, is if you want to go back to the original game, it is that thing. We, I think we were talking about it last week when you get a classic mode yeah. in a game. So you can press, press a button and suddenly all the original graphics come back and the original level design and the original boss fights pretty much. The Master System version, you can play that as well if you want to. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That is awesome. Looking forward to it. You have to let us know how it is if you're going to be getting it on the Switch. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, the weekend's coming up again. You know, I always look for some good Switch games to play while the missus is watching Love Island or something boring on telly. Oh, God. (laughs) She's watching something boring like the football. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think there was some, like, England game or something on earlier today. We're not football fans. (laughs) We're not football fans, unfortunately. (laughs) But I heard heard they did all right anyway. Um, But, yeah, this looks awesome. Apparently, obviously, new music as well. That's obviously a big part of these kind of new versions, HD updates of games so uh yeah n- nice title to get an update i think and like i said very at home on the switch so um i'll let you lads know what it's like now before we chat to flint dilly let's just give a big mention to our wonderful friends at bitmap books who are sponsors of the retro Hour podcast we love sam and the team there we've worked with them for years and they do just the most incredible retro gaming books these things are real celebrations real love letters to all aspects of retro gaming and in my hand (laughs) weighing down my hand actually two hands to hold this is a copy of their newest book a guide to japanese role-playing games now i just want you guys to maybe turn your headphones down ever so slightly or just maybe take them off for a second this might be loud let me just gently place this on my desk nice You need, you need that to is add a some reverb and like earthquake effects. Yeah. Sounds like a drum snare. <laughs> I think I just heard the neighbours bang on the wall. It was that loud. This is their latest book that is actually the biggest book that Bitmap Books have ever done, weighing in at a massive 652 pages. It's an absolute beast and dedicated to all things Japanese role-playing games. Now, I know, Joe, you're you're kind of our, our resident fan, aren't you? Yeah, man, I'm a really, really big RPG fan, really big JRPG fan as well. And, you know, there's literally hundreds of games covered in this, um, which is absolutely amazing. You know, games, you know, you've got all your big games like Final Fantasy and Chrono Trigger, which we were just talking about a minute ago, and Chrono Cross um, and Dot Hack. But literally the list is just like hundreds of hundreds of games and lots of games, lots of JRPGs that I haven't even thought about for years on there, like Seventh Saga, Seventh Dragon. Um, you know, Albert Odyssey is one of my favourites as well. And, you know, the quality of these books as well, absolutely amazing you know you know big massive like dan just showed us big massive hardback books with just amazing amazing quality to them as well and it's not just like the old 8-bit or 16-bit games like I, i'm looking here and they've got uh, uh what we just talked about in the patrons which was a uh, panzer dragon saga and mm. also skies of arcadia do you remember that oh one? wow that, yeah, that yeah, was yeah such a great game Yeah, so if you're a fan of JRPGs, you cannot afford to miss out on this book. The Definitive Guide, weighing in at a massive 652 pages. Now, unfortunately, this is actually so popular, it launched last Friday and both the Standard and Collector's Editions instantly sold out. Although, we've been told that a guide to Japanese role-playing games is going to be reprinted and back on sale in early October. So if you nip onto their website, bitmapbooks.co.uk, there is a little button on there that says, email me when available, and then they will drop you a quick email when it's reprinted and the stock is back again. So please check that out and all their other range of incredible retro gaming books. And of course, support the Retro Hour podcast by showing a bit of love to our sponsors. Check out their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Now, each week on the show, we celebrate a local retro gaming store. 
Now, we're talking about the places that you go to, maybe on a Saturday, that first place that you go into, and you want to check out what new retro games they've got in this week. The places that often have stuff in there that, you know, really know the video games, they're big fans of it as well. Often you can get better deals on places like Amazon or eBay. And we want to make sure that these retro gaming havens are there for years to come. So each week we're asking you, get in touch with us and tell us where you go locally to pick up your retro games. And we will give them a free shout on the show, a bit of free advertising so everyone knows how incredible they are. And uh, we'd love you to get in touch and tell us about yours. Now this week, we're going to one in Bellevue, Washington. Yeah, so we got contacted by a podcast called Into the Vertical Blank. Uh, Have you ever heard of these guys? No, but yeah, I checked out their Twitter after they got in touch. Um, It looks an interesting show. Yeah, and uh, this shop's called Game Over. And Game Over seems to be like a little kind of brand in America. So they've got a couple of them. They've got one in um, Austin, Texas as well. And, um, you know, these guys into the vertical blank, they said, check out the place. And we've just got a nice haul of 2600 SNES and NES games there. And there's some photos of this place as well. And, my God, they've got all these boxes on the wall and uh, i think these boxes are for display only they're not selling all of these systems um but they are selling a few systems below Uh, well that's that says to me for them to have these beautiful boxes on display at the back that just says to me how well stocked they must be Mm. in the actual shop you know you know from the pictures i can see and stuff they've got plenty of games plenty of you know gaming memorabilia and stuff like that but yeah they've got all these beautiful you know, some rare systems as well, like the Watermelon N64, you know, really nice condition Sega CD and stuff like that, Turbo Graphics 16. But that says to me that they must have a lot of these things for sale. I mean, they've got the cabinets that I can see here of all the consoles. Um, so, you know, it, it just looks like a really, really nice shop. And I always get really jealous of these shops because I just want to go see them all the time. This one's literally like 5,000 <laughs> miles away from us, but it does look awesome. It looks good as well because they've got like um, a cabinet by the looks of it, when you walk in the store, like you said, there's a, a CRT monitor on top here. They've got a, a Master System 2 with a Sega CD2 as well. Um, looks like a set they're selling there. They've got a couple of Commodore 64 Cs, all different variants of the Atari 2600, the Woody, the Vader, the Junior. They've got an Intellivision 2 there as well. So it looks like, you know, so I don't generally see over here those kind of systems in retro gaming stores anymore. I'll go in and maybe I'll see a Mega Drive or I might see like an NES or a Game Boy, but stuff like, you know, the Commodore 64 and the um, the Sega CDs are getting much harder to find. I don't know if you guys have found the same over here. Yeah, and I find I find what's local to them as well, like the inter- television too. You're never going to yeah. see that in, in Europe. And uh, just having them on display, also a nice power glove just uh, stuck at the side there. Looks a really cool place. If you're ever near Bellevue, Washington, check them out. They're called Game Over, and we'll put a link to them in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, just time to give a big mention to the people who have made it into the Hall of Fame this week. Joe, quick quiz. How do you get into the Hall of Fame? Here we go. Bloody hell. We haven't done this for a while. <laughs> I haven't done this for a while. You know what? Last time you went to do this, I put it on you. <laughs> so and I was like, oh, so to get into our Hall of Fame, our high score... Our high scoreboard um, is to simply just be a Patreon with us and just support the show. You know, you don't just get to get a shout out on the high score Hall of Fame. You you do get a few benefits. You know, you get access to our, our Patreon hangout, which we do once a month on a Sunday night where we all get together and just have a bit of a laugh and talk about everything retro and kind of show off, you know, the games we've been playing, the games we've been buying and stuff like that over the last couple of weeks. That's always a really, really good laugh. Um, and you also get exclusive access to our our second podcast show, uh, which is called the Retro Hour After Hours, where we get together and we have a different theme every week. You know, the one coming out shortly, we're going to be doing our favourite Super Nintendo memories and Super Nintendo games. Um, But we've been doing a series every other month of like video games in the years and we've been covering different years. So like 99, 2000, and we've just done 2001, which was a really, really awesome year with lots of lots of great memories and lots of great games. Um, And then, like I say, you know, you keep the show running for us because obviously it's it's not free for us to do this. And, you know, it started out as a hobby and now it's kind of, you know, become something a little bit bigger. But that's thanks to all you guys. But it does cost us money. So just supporting us really, really helps us out. 
Yeah, and also you get the normal show um, early most weeks. You get it ad-free. But like Joe said, really you're doing it just to make sure that this podcast keeps coming out every Friday. We can keep bringing you the news. We can keep bringing these incredible guests to you as well. And we will give you a big thank you on the show in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, a big thank you to Mark Gidley. Bill Kavanagh. Olden. Gary Antcliffe. And Al Newman who all made donations into the running of the show. Thank you so much for your support. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find it on our website, theretrohour.com. That is also the same place you'll find our survey. Another way you can help out this show. Tell us what you like about it. Tell us what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of. Your input is going to be so valuable to us. And of course, you could win £100 to spend on retro gaming goodies. You'll find that survey right now on our website at theretrohour.com. Right next an incredible guest on the show talking about so many retro things that are going to take you back there's a bit of Transformers chatting here I've already listened to this interview it's so good Soviet strike nuclear strike our guest this week is the amazing Flint Dilly and he's on the show next you're listening to the Retro Hour and I'm here with Flint Dilly how are you doing Flint? oh just great just great Hi, it's good to have you on. And, uh, you know, we start with a question that we ask all our guests. And that was like, what was your first gaming experience, be it a board game or Dungeons and Dragons or, or something oh, that really mean, stood like, out to you? playing a game, not designing one? Yeah, one of your first yeah. memories. Well, uh, like, we'll get rid of like tic-tac-toe and stuff like that. I remember uh, I was like... I- probably like first grade and they they we had a exercise at uh at my school where where all the like you know kids who are older like the impossibly old sixth graders dressed up like chess <laughs> pieces and they taught us how to play chess and that was a really great experience because i couldn't do much else in life but i could play chess i mean i, I learned how and uh and then just went on you know stratego broadside monopoly clue you know all the normal stuff so that was like a giant human a giant human chessboard with the kids then yeah it was a giant human chessboard and that like really fascinated me and so i just like you know kept uh playing and playing and playing and uh what got you into stories and which tales fascinated you as a youth oh yeah and what's kind of you know all the usual stuff i mean i was you know well i was dyslexic i couldn't read very well you know and Mm -hmm. i mean it took me a long time to to get into reading so People read things to me, and my parents would buy like absolutely anything if they thought I read it. They bought comic mm-hmm. books back when that was subversive, and and like I could have Mad Magazine, and none of the other kids could. And so I, you know, I grew up really on television. I mean, you know, to, you know, to, in the beginning, and then when I finally could read, then you know, then I started reading stuff. But yeah, you know, once again, just like you know, like everything, you know, I, I, even to this day, I'm pretty omnivorous. You know, it, it's like. The, everything from like Hardy Boys to you know Ray Bradbury. I let, read a lot of Ray Bradbury for some reason. He he like connected to me very early on. Well, how did you end up becoming a professional writer? And like you 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 also must have been in the peak time that sci fi was blowing up in the kind of seventies. Well, okay, two things happened. Three things happened the same week. And one was I graduated from college. Two Star Wars came out, and three my parents moved to. Carmel, which is a, a town just, you know, it's south, but, you know, a couple hours south of San Francisco. So I knew I was staying in California for the long term because I got out of college and had absolutely no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life, except I had written my first <laughs> my first novel and it was a fraternity house murder mystery. But uh, and the first thing I ever wrote was, uh, you know, a book that never got finished, but I still, oddly enough, I still have it. And that was a friend of mine just decided to write a novel on, you know, in like seventh grade. I was like, wow, you like we, we can just sit down and write novels. I mean, one thing that was good about that period, and you know, I'm not saying it's not true now, it might be true now, but you know, you, we didn't know what we couldn't do. So it was like, oh, we think it's kind of cool. These guys have rock bands. Well, let's go get guitars and we'll have a band. You know, you, you could just you sort of felt you could do anything. And so, yeah, the first one I wrote was probably in junior high. You know, we started writing was probably in junior high. I don't think it's going to uh, top off the uh, the uh, literary masterpiece. And it was probably, I remember Arthur Clarke's 2001. Yeah, because I read the novelization of the movie. Mm. And that was uh, that was like something that was really influential I mean, when sci-fi was blowing up. Like I had all that stuff. Mm. You know, my, my grandfather created a thing called Buck Rogers, which was a comic strip in the 20s. Yeah. 
And, and so that stuff was all around me all the time anyway. You know, it wasn't like that was alien material to me. Buck Rogers, uh, I didn't know that you had a family connection. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that series. Uh, it was fantastic. Well, I remember it was a comic strip, okay? I mean, in the, in, it was released in 1929, like in, during the Depression. I don't know if you had a depression in England too, but we had, we had a depression in the 20s. And mm. so it was a comic strip for before the Gil Gerard, Aaron Gray show. It was a comic strip. They made cereals. You can see Buster Crab in the cereals. Uh, but the point is, is that, you know, that, that was not weird stuff to me. And yeah, I pretty much felt that, you know, uh, you could actually make a living, you know, creating, you know, science fiction and fantasy and stuff like that. So I, I was never really afraid of that. So um, you did um, some screenwriting and you actually, uh, I've got here that you did the screenwriting for Transformers, the movie. Um, how did that come about? And what was it like converting the series and the toy products into a legendary film? Well, I, it was funny. You know, I, I, I went to film school. I mean, I got out of college. And I had no idea mm. what I was going to do with the rest of my life, right? Yeah, mm. zero. I really didn't think about it. And uh, and so, you know, after like kind of sitting, sitting around in my parents' house for a year, I decided, well, I'll get serious about life and go to film school. So I yeah. went down to USC and a couple of years later, you know, I, I don't know what I thought I was going to be writing or, or directing or doing afterwards, but a couple of years later, the first actual paying job I got as a screenwriter was a guy named Joe Ruby hired me to do, uh, to do Saturday morning TV shows. Joe created mm-hmm. Scooby-Doo, Joe, uh, Joe and his partner, Ken Spears. And so I was doing that. And then I went to Lucasfilm and sort of had a disastrous you know period doing, uh, uh, Star Wars Saturday morning show, I think called Droids. That, that was a disaster. And oh, right, yeah. Wore off. I'm never going to do robots again. So <laughs> after that summer, a guy named Steve Gerber called me up and he said, uh, yeah, I'm ghost. I, I'm story editing a show called G.I. Joe, and I'm mm. kind of falling behind. You want to come in and ghost story edit? And so that was how, you know, that was how I got into the syndicated, the, you know, the Hasbro, the toy shows and all that was I was – uh, story editor and then associate producer on GI Joe, and then about a year in, and maybe not even that long, they said, "Hey, look, you know, we want you to come do Transformers." Uh, and I and I said, "You know, I, I don't do robots." They said, "Yeah, you do." Uh, and so uh, <laughs> this was uh, Tom Griffin and Joe Bacall. So all of a sudden, I was in the Transformer business. So yeah, I mean, that, that's how they that came. They just you know they just moved me over from GI Joe to Transformers because. At the time, Transformers was kind of in trouble. We were we were losing to a show called GoBots. Uh, one day, Jay showed up and said, "Hey, we have a draft of the movie. We got to do a rewrite in a week." And so we we rewrote the movie. I I did like probably twenty drafts that summer. It was summer eighty five, I think. Well, you were also uh, a writer for the ET ride in Florida, and I think I should ask uh, Joe. Uh, to tell us about his experience on the ET ride because you've actually been on it as well. I, I How have... did you get involved in that? Well, it was funny. Okay, so after Transformers and and the whole Sunbow period, I just went to the right party on the right night and met Lisa Henson, who she's Jim Henson's daughter, but she, more importantly for this story, she was a vice president at, at Warner Brothers. And she said, "Oh, we're doing a uh, we're doing a uh, kid." She found out I wrote animation. Uh, we're doing a kids animated. Uh, show and i said uh, of the of the looney tune characters which may, it was i'm sorry it was good at, at that point it was a movie and so the next and i didn't even know the difference between the looney tune characters and the tiny tune characters but the next day i'm sitting in a pitch or like two days later a pitch over at amblin so i got hired i got hired by steven spielberg and did that and then five goes west and and then for a while i was just i, I had a, a deal with them and I was just kind of their literary janitor. And so I'd get these calls that were, hey, Stephen needs needs his opening dialogue for the E.T. ride. And it's like, oh, OK, you know, or, or like they were doing promos for the Universal theme park. And so I was up all night working with Doc Brown, you know, from Back to the Future, you yeah. know, writing his stuff for promos. I think that's on on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I was. I just got a lot of jobs like that. The funny thing about the ET ride was uh, when well, you tell your story. What's your story of the ET ride? No, I, I just Ravi was telling me about it earlier on all the stuff you'd worked on, and I was just like, "That's crazy!" Because if for me, this is all my childhood right now. You know, you just talking about GI Joe, talking about Transformers, and then from funny enough, obviously we're from England, so we don't have you know Disney World and stuff and Universal Studios. Right. 
but for my for well, my, you have, uh, like, you have castles and stuff like yeah that. we have castles yeah, and yeah. stuff like that and manners um but for my my honeymoon we actually went to universal studios in florida and you know we went on the et ride and i just i remember you know it's such a silly children's ride but it was yeah. you know when there's all these big roller coasters and everything but it was probably my favorite ride there and it's just funny how life comes full circle that i'm now talking to the guy who wrote <laughs> you know wrote the ride <laughs> was the writer for the ride well, it was funny because uh, um, I'd say, well, it had to be like, you know, 10, 15 years later because I was at Universal and mm. with my daughter. She was the only, uh, I mean, sorry, at, uh, yeah, the Universal uh, backlot, right? Yeah. And I'm there with my daughter and we're standing in line. I'm saying, boy, this sounds really familiar. And I realized, <laughs> oh, I wrote this. You know, it was like <laughs> in the last days of the ET ride. And it's like, yeah, you know, it, it was it was just this weird moment of of you know thinking quite probably I mean that had to be I mean she was born in two thousand uh, two thousand one so mm. you know they had to be like you know thirteen years later mm. and just kind of like wow yeah somewhere back in this distant life I had I wrote Stephen's intro for the ET ride huh. That's crazy oh. in the depths of your memory. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and I sort of, you know, because I did so many things like that at that point that, I, you know, I just sort of forgotten about it. It just took me by surprise. I'm pretty sure the Florida one's still there because when they, oh, removed, wow. yeah, when they removed it from the California one, Steven Spielberg got upset because of that was the final Spielberg film that was still right. in operation because of the Back to the Future ride had gone and the Jaws ride had gone, you know, making way for right. Fast and Furious and all that kind of stuff. They never um, should have gotten rid of the Jaws ride. No, they not. shouldn't have. They shouldn't have at all. They're, they're, the classic rides are the best ones. And uh, when they came to saying, we're thinking of getting rid of the Florida one, he said, if you do that, I'm not working with Universal Studios again. So they've kept it there. So that's how wow. I managed to go on it in like 20... I've been on it in 2017 and 2018. We went to well, ours. Stephen really, really loves it. I mean, you realize his, yeah. his office is part of... is a tram stop at the uh, Universal Tour. They, there you they go. Stop the tram, but they point out <laughs> his office. I mean... What's that tell you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, working on theme park rides, did you kind of shift your interest and start to look into other formats like video games? Oh, no. Video games came a whole different way. And that is mm. at the exact same time I started writing cartoons, I met a guy named Gary Gygax, the guy who created Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And it kind of became his protege. So I, I was designing, you know, games and we were playing, you know, chain mail endlessly and we wrote Pick a Path Adventures together. I was always a gamer. I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, I remember when I got out of college, I was walking down a street in Monterey and I walked by a game store and I said, if I could do anything, I'd like design these games. But at that point, this is like the late seventies, you know, D and D was out, you know, and mm -hmm. I played it Berkeley, but I, yeah, I didn't think anybody could really make a living design doing games. You know, I, I just thought, you know, I, I would, I just had no idea how to do that. I knew how to go to film school and make movies. So that's what I did. So um, how did it kind of come about? Because Book Rogers Countdown to Doom was, you know, I believe that was your first big game that you worked on. Was that was, your first a, that game? was the first one. Yes. Yeah. And how did that come about? Well, uh, what happened was at, 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 I think like 85 or so, my sister mm. bought TSR, the game company that makes Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, wow. And we okay. the rights to Buck Rogers. So we said, well, let's do some Buck Rogers stuff. Mm. And the first thing we did was a, a, a board game. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was called, uh, I don't even remember what it was called. Um, Battle for the Battle for the 25th Century, I think, Buck Rogers. Uh mm. And th I mean, that did really well. That was, and th at that point I was just designing like kind of pure board games, but you couldn't make your living. I didn't, I didn't actually get paid for the stuff I did with TSR, you know, but I loved doing it and I was writing movies anyway. So I didn't, you know, I didn't really have to get paid. And so the first thing we did was battle for the future. You know, Warren Spector worked on that and he went on to do a lot of video games and Jeff Grubb and, and Jim Ward, who's was in my, my Google feed today because they've reopened TSR and Ernie Guy Guy. I mean, you know, it was just like the whole classic, you know, team at one point or another. We, we what the whole idea with that? I'll get to the countdown game in a second, but there's a little backstory. Mm. And and you know, we it, it, the whole idea was is going to be risk, but with moving planets. And then yeah. the game master games were out, like Axis and Allies. You know, the Hasbro was doing those, and so we, we made it like that. So you, you're you know flying through space, and you have fighters, bombers, transports genetically engineered mutants and all that. So, and, and we wrote a whole Bible for it because that was after, I think I started it while I was still doing transformers. 
But I just approached that iteration of Buck Rogers like it, you know, the same way I approached GI Joe and Transformers and the other stuff I did for Sunbow. So, um, so we did that game, and meanwhile, Mike Pondsmith uh, and I took the Buck Rogers concept and turned it into a role playing game. I mean, it was really Pondsmith wrote the role playing game. You know, who, who was doing Cyberpunk at that exact moment? Mm. Yeah, you talk about something that resonates in twenty twenty. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> And he, and he was great, you know, and so that was like, that was the first sort of, you know, massive, you know, epic role playing game I was involved in. So the uh, TSR had a deal with SSI. And so uh, Pondsmith called me up and said, hey, they want to turn the role playing game into or maybe my sister did. I don't remember who did. Somebody did. And uh, into a video game. It's like, oh, great. And I would say very possibly the most fun role playing session I've ever had was we role played through what would become Countdown to Doomsday. I mean, we're sitting there, you know, a bunch of goofs, you know, just you know, going through the beats of the story in the video game, but literally role playing them. And, and I, you know, I think that is to this day the best way to to uh, to design a game. Yeah, they, and they still do that. You know, a lot of the um, Japanese companies and stuff. When modern games come out, you actually see the directors of the game running around with a toy gun, showing. The, the you know the writers this is what they want to happen you know in the game and this is what they want to happen in the cgi cutscene and stuff and, it, and like you say it's goofing about it's the best way to do it that is the best way to do it i mean uh, what you mentioned soviet strike and, and what's mm. interesting about that is mike becker who i've done stuff you know i don't know for the last four decades i mm. think with mike becker i mean he uh the first thing we did was soviets no we did it we did a couple games with a company called pf magic the, I mean, the first like kind of proper console games I ever did really were, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, Countdown to Doomsday was the first computer game. But we I did a lot of stuff for um, what first Hasbro Electronics. I mean, this is here's your your old video game trivia uh, had a company called Isix and they had, yeah. they had some other name for it, too. And we made games like. Uh, I remember coming in at the tail end and not doing much, but coming in at the tail end of uh, Night Trap. Yeah, it was uh, Jim Riley and I think Rob mm. Fuller. And then we did uh, Double Switch. That was well, that was my real intro into video games. Well, when did you kind of first see CD-ROM interactive games? And uh, like, what were your thoughts when you initially saw a, a Sega CD? Oh, I was well. I mean, because remember, I'd had this dress rehearsal with the with the Hasbro format, so I'd, I already knew pretty much what that medium was going to be like. But uh, mm. Sega CD, my thought was, hey, now I can merge my two careers because I've got this game design career going, and I've got this movie writing career going, and you know, and I was writing books and movies and all sorts of stuff. But I figured now you can do it all at the same time. You know, it's like yeah. oh, good. You know, you can tell a story in a game. Was it difficult kind of going from, you know, working on TV and movies and, you know, filming movies and stuff like that to then filming the interactive games for Sega and Sega CD? Or was it as simple as that? You know, they just molded together, came together, you know, easily. It it, it was as simple as that. I mean, you know, because because I I don't tend to be real linear to begin with. So Mm. uh, the interactive stuff is frankly easier. You know, games have always been easier than movies. Was was the story like uh, story writing a bit of a change as well? Well, yeah, you have you have to build a game story totally differently than you would build a movie story. You know, in a uh, uh, you know, in a, with a movie story, it's got to be all this whole linear thing, and you know, every single thing counts. But you pretty much know that you're what the what the product's going to be with a game story. Yeah, you, know, you first start with branching. Well, if you think about branching for a second, it can go on exponentially forever. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So it's kind of like a choose, choose your own adventure. Right. And that, that was the first game writing I did. It was for books, but Gary and Gary Gygax and I did a series of choose your own adventure books and we had a fighting system in it. So it, I'd already, I'd already done a little bit of game design. And while I was up there, we were constantly, we were playing, you know, we had a giant sand table. And so we were playing chain mail and, you know, inventing scenarios and, you know, what we now call mods and all, you know, alt rule systems and stuff like that. Mm. So yeah, yeah. When, when it came to doing the, the Sega CD games, the, I, you know, that wasn't really a big step. 
it was just doing it on film, but I was very familiar with that. And a lot of the issues of doing video games are very similar to animation issues. Well, what did you think of the 3DO as well? And how was that kind of sold to you? Because I know there was a lot of hype behind that system at the time. Well, it's funny. The guy I was just talking about, Mike Becker, was, was I remember one year, three, a 3DO was coming out. And one year at E3, I remember seeing Becker. I couldn't get there because he, like, he, he was in an area where he couldn't really get to. But see, he was dem- demoing the 3DO. And all they had was some kind of fake footage from uh, Jurassic Park. <laughs> and something about the 3DO, I mean, I love the fact that it existed. It was sort of the promise of everything that was going to happen. But somehow 3DO just didn't seem real to me. You know, it was kind of the, the first dress rehearsal I had for, you know, a format that was not going to take off, but was mm. going to, um, was what everybody wanted. And so, Ahead of yes, time. Like CD and, and frankly, for me, the PlayStation 1 yeah. was when, you know, we first got to do everything we really wanted to do. So you were uh, mentioned earlier on that uh, you worked on Double Switch and also mentioned uh, Night Trap there. A couple of questions I had around. very, very little to do with Night Trap, but that oh, was yeah. my intro to it. But did a bunch of games for, for that system. Yeah, so I was going to say, what, what was it like working with Corey Haim? You know, how did you kind of get involved on that project? And also, do you think Night, I was going to say, do you think Double Switch would have been bigger if it wasn't for the controversy around Night Trap? Well, no, I think the controversy around Night Trap was like the best thing that ever happened to Oh, Night okay. Trap. Well, I mean, kind of that's called marketing and just in a different mm. way. If you have Joe Lieberman waving your, you know, your game around in the House of Representatives, that's a, that's a great thing. But, uh, uh, it's, you know, that, well, it, it was just a really flawed format. I mean, the, the idea was cool. Mm. But the truth is, is I think at best you could get an hour of video onto the discs, right? And yeah. and the video was what we called granola vision, yeah, because it was like this, you know, there are facts <laughs> all over it. It was grainy, <laughs> yeah. And so by the time we're doing double switch, yeah, it was great. I mean, Corey Heim, I only remember from one day on the set, and he was just a very friendly guy. You know, I mean, he mm-hmm. was, you know, because he thought, oh, this is one of the bad boys from Hollywood, but he certainly didn't seem like it that day. And you know, yeah. Debbie Harry there, it's like, wow, Blondie's like in in my game. Yeah. Um, and Mary Lambert directed it. And Mary Lambert's a great director. She'd just yeah. done, uh, I think she'd just done um, Pet Cemetery. Oh, okay. It's yeah. one of the best Stephen King adaptations. Mm. Yeah, that's a film that genuinely scared me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so Mary, I, I you know, worked with a great deal on that. And her husband, Jerome Gary, who I do things with for the next you know three decades. Well, being involved with uh, TSR as well, you did some like interactive Dungeons and Dragons stuff as well. Boy, you guys did your research. Yes. I mean, what it was, <laughs> was we had this idea or this was around, you know, kind of after Sega CD. But the idea was, well, why don't we do audio interactive? Interestingly enough, it was my sister's idea. They were just trying to figure out, you know, how do you how do you, do, you know, take D&D and, and we did other things, too, and and turn them into you know, a different, you know, a different media and use audio for it. You know, that was the challenge. And we tried it pretty much every way we could. And those, I, I, those things came out really kind of pretty well. I mean, some of them did, but it ranged all the way from like Red Steel, which was the, yeah, there was narration and it set up the adventure and all that, but it was really just a soundtrack to have in the background when you're playing the game, you know, like kind of the musical stings to emphasize, you know, plot developments, right? And I've, I've so, seen a, quite a few modern board games actually do that now, have this like interactive soundtrack that you, you, you play along with. Yeah, and that's what I like about it. We were doing that in the 90s, right? You know, and uh, uh, yeah, it was the early 90s. Well, probably 90, 92, 93, I would guess. Maybe it was after that. I just don't remember exactly. What, but we, those went on for a long time. Uh, we had, you know, that too, we had really broken apart ones like. Um, was it uh, Planescape, where you had little snippets of dialogue. You'd play like, you know, we had hundreds of them on there. They were almost like alt, you know, alt dialogues that you know, I, I do for video games later on. But the thing I had a lot of fun with was Terror Tracks, because mm. we did an audio interactive. We did two of them. We had Track of the Werewolf and Track of the Vampire. And mm. basically it was, uh, it was kind of like, uh, you know, you make a 911 call, and if they heard that, there was something occult going on. They would send the special unit of uh, the, you know, the track squad, which was mm. race, research, analyze, and exterminate. Um, 
and they go out and, you know, kill the monsters. It was kind of like cops, but, you know. It yeah. was, and then we did a, that was an interesting one because we then did a, um, a video, you know, an interactive video for, uh, I think it was on Sega CD, but it was certainly on PC. Yeah. I can't remember what, uh, uh, called uh, Terror Tracks. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, that was really cool. We did a lot of experimental. That was a, the the period in the '90s. That's when we made Dragon Strike, uh, which would, you know, was a, trying to teach people the bridge between a board game and a role playing game. Mm. Um, we did a lot of kind of fun experimental stuff then. All that stuff paid off much later on. So uh, our next questions were actually about Terra Tracks. Um, funny enough, so obviously, like you say, it came out on the PC on the CD ROM. Yes. How did you find working with the PC CD ROM? You know, obviously, you've got better screen resolution, bigger screen, and stuff like that. There was more options. Was that easier yep. to work with? Was that better? No, it was great because what happened, that one came about in a really funny way. Mm -hmm. And that was we had a little bit of budget left on the audio CDs. And I talked to my sister. Well, I I had two friends. One was Peter Marks, who had done a game called Johnny Mnemonic, if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. And and Peter done Johnny Mnemonic. And John Platten, who had later do a lot of stuff with, did Johnny Mnemonic. uh, Mnemonic. And um, so he had the algorithm. And then another guy named Chris Walker had the new four chip or whatever it was, uh, video camera. And so we mm-hmm. decided, well, let's just do the, like the audio CD, but let's just shoot it on video. And we got Peter's algorithm so you can automatically make your choices. And we can do just a whole branching uh, video game story. Mm-hmm. And so we did a demo. We had enough budget to do the demo. And then uh, Grolier's bought it. And then we finished production. And, and that ended up like, getting turned into a TV pilot. Um, did, you, did. did you see that happen with any other interactive movies as well? And kind of what happened with oh, that Well, pilot? almost, almost. Uh, I don't know. I never saw it happen with an interactive movie, but that was kind of an accident. I was at a, at a uh, talent agency called Creative... Uh, no, no, this was, I was at ICM at the time, uh, International Creative Management. And I was showing the... Because I shot the, the demo of the video mm. for Terror Tracks. I shot actually shot the whole thing, but I was showing the demo to my agent and the TV agent walked by, literally walked by in the background and he said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's just the interactive uh, video game I'm doing. And he said, no, that's a TV show. And I said, no, it's an interactive video game. No, you don't get it. It's a TV <laughs> show. So that was our conversation. You know, this is like, imagine, you know, an agency in the early nineties, right? You know, they, they, yeah. they were kind of ill. And uh, um, uh, Steve Wall. Whose whose father uh, controlled the rights to Tales from the Crypt? Okay. Anyway, so uh, so Steve says, you know, he calls me and says, "Okay, you can either have Joe Dante or, or Rennie Harlan." And I thought, "Well, that's an interesting choice because Rennie Harlan was incredibly hot at that moment, and and Joe Dante was, I think, working on Small Soldiers. I could be wrong about that, but mm. uh, and he was still doing stuff. And you know, just one thing led to another, and we ended up going with Rennie." He uh, uh, and and, you know, so, yeah, he ended up directing the pilot uh, right after he did Deep Blue Sea. And what was really funny is just in the period we were doing that, Rennie just, you know, hit a lot of banana peels, you know, and, uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, Cutthroat Island and, and all and uh, Deep Blue Sea, which which actually was a pretty good movie. If you go back and watch it. Yeah, it, I, you know, I watched it again last year. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's it, it's really pretty good. He just came out the same weekend as Blair Witch Project. Yeah, which is is the ultimate in getting not lucky because you know if you're looking at it from a studio point of view, Blair Witch Project cost you know seventy five cents to shoot, and Deep Blue Sea seventy five million. <laughs> yeah, it made seventy five million exactly. And Deep Blue Sea probably right. cost seventy five million and made seventy five million. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was the you know uh, so yeah Blair Witch was that was a very big deal, but it was also what the first time I ever. Like actually, you know, you know, touched an ARG marketing object, mm. you know, also in a reality game. Because you know, I'm, I'm standing in my video store and there's this flyer about this missing film crew. And it's one of those things you look at it and it's like, is this real or fake? Yeah. And it was, it was promo stuff for uh, Blair Witch Project. I, I remember going to the premiere, and uh, this was in the UK, and they put sick bags underneath all the seats. And I was like, "What is it? Because it's so scary." And they were like, "No, it's the motion sickness that you get with the camera." <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> yes. 
So um, you also worked on Maximum Surge. How complete was yep. it? And what was the story behind that? Because I'm, I'm not too familiar with Maximum Surge myself. Oh, Maximum Surge was, I mean, I, you know, let me put it this way. While I was cleaning out, I had to clean out my storage and I had, you know, probably 35 years of stuff in there. I have a really large storage area in my place. And so I just keep throwing boxes in there for 35 years. And, and last fall, I cleaned it out. And I actually found the script for it, but I have almost amnesia for maximum surge. I just remember a train barreling down and and people trying to stop it. That's <laughs> you know, <laughs> everything I know about maximum. Surge. You know, because sometimes you get projects that you know if there's no afterlife for the project, you almost have amnesia for doing it. Yeah, yeah, it was planned for the PC and the Sega Saturn, wasn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. the demo, yeah, I found demo the was only released, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, found the script for a theme park ride that was never finally done but it's the thing i did with john dykstra and it was uh a the egyptian book of the dead is a theme park ride for okay. a pyramid in memphis i'm not making that up because memphis right. was the ancient capital of uh, egypt <laughs> and so and so there you know they had twin themes of ancient egypt and elvis presley and so we were we, we did that ride and um just just back with maximum surge why did they why did everybody kind of want to stop that what, what was the story there well, my, my feeling was that Maximum Surge, uh, okay, you're, everything I'm telling you might well be a lie or a, or a manufactured memory, you know, because I mean, I don't remember it very well. I remember, yeah. I, oddly enough, I remember the flow chart I did for it better than I remember the game itself. But I, my feeling was that that was kind of late in the, at some point they realized that with the Sega, with the, you know, those kind of, you know, fractured grammar, you know, movie games. That mm-hmm. that you know they weren't they weren't really taken off and they and, and you know they it wasn't a satisfying medium because mm-hmm. I mean, the fundamental math problem with them was that in those days with a video game there the video game company was expected to give a dollar of uh, a basic uh, you know you get one hour of entertainment for every dollar spent on the game. Uh, and so basically, if you have one hour of video, which is what you get onto a CD-ROM. Uh, that that meant that you had, uh, yeah, and and somebody was paying forty bucks for it. You had to have forty hours of entertainment. Mm. Okay, so that meant you had thirty nine hours of stuff that is not, um, <laughs> not your entertainment. You know, to do the game. You see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was, there's just a math problem, uh, and so you, they couldn't ultimately end up being that satisfying of games. Oh, okay. So they pulled that's, the just, that's just my opinion. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. Cool. So, um, obviously, we've mentioned Soviet Strike and a few games for the PlayStation stuff. When did you first see the PlayStation? When did you first hear about it? And what was your initial thoughts with it? Well, first, yeah, I mean, the first time I, I I mean, I don't know when I first heard that there was a thing called the Sony PlayStation coming out. I mean, I don't remember that. Mm. Probably at E3, because in those days, you know, I went to E3 every year. Um, Or you just hear rumors about it or somebody was working on a project. But, uh, but what I do remember is I had played the other strike games, you know, Desert Strike, Jungle Strike, and Urban Strike. And I love those games. Yeah. I mean, those are just great. I went and saw, what was that? Tom, uh, it was a, uh, I think it was a Tom Clancy movie. It was that, um, oh, Clear and Pre- and it was a Clear and Present Danger. It was one of the movies where they had the satellite shot of the guys running in, you know, the you know, special forces running in. Yeah. And so I remember going to see that and I thought, I want a game like that. I walked to you and, and in those days you had video game stores all over the place. So there's a video game store next to the theater. And I walked in and I said, I just saw uh, Clear and Present Danger and I want the, a video game that's like that. And they gave me uh, a Desert Strike, which is one of the best games I've ever played. And mm-hmm. so I was extremely familiar. And then it, I remember it was the last phone call I got before going to my wedding. Uh, Mike Becker called. Said the same Mike Becker. And he said, uh, hey, you want to, uh, uh, I got a really great project. We got bandwidth. And I said, yeah, I'm in. And he was at Electronic Arts, but he couldn't tell yeah. me what it was. And then I, I got there and I found out, yeah, we're doing a, a you know, full motion video enhanced story version of the strike games. And I was thinking, oh, man, that's the most perfect thing I've ever seen in my life. I was going to say, that's like the planets aligning for you or something. Like oh, that. the planets totally aligned. And, <laughs> and if you think about those games, what that what we did, you know, what I did was, it, it was not dissimilar from GI to GI Joe. Yeah. And then Mike, Mike and I would work together on a project for DARPA 
which, which was kind of like, you know, two decades later, kind of mm. like the adult version of, you know, the, uh, the disinformation. Remember that in Soviet strike, they, they'd always have a cover story for, you know, they just trash half the <laughs> yeah. you know, regional <laughs> world. And it would be a forest fire, just strike. And, and we were basically doing a fake news game, uh, not mm. game, simulation for DARPA. Yeah. Well, what funny. were the what was the industry's kind of reaction? Because I, I remember a lot of people thinking, you know, the the PlayStation's going to come out and Sony creating a console. What is this? And uh, especially yeah, kind of Sony Interactive as well. That well, that's what I was saying. I mean, what was interesting about that was that uh, the the play the you know I, I I did not get the impression. I you know, don't quote me on this because I may be lying to you, but I did not get the impression that. Uh, they had much confidence in the PlayStation. I think that they, they you know, signed up to do Soviet strike, uh, you know, kind of to say, hey, Sony, we're, you know, we're bet, I mean, we're going to put a bet on you. Our, our, like we had our marketing guy was like a brand new guy. It was Mike Quigley, who later I'd work out, work with at Niantic. But it was like nobody had any, you know, I, you, know they, you, you know, we just had our own little area and they gave us a room. And at that point, you know, John Manley, you know, who designed the original ones, was designing it. And, you know, Mike Becker was there at that moment. He was quitting smoking. So he built to deal with quitting smoking. He built like 800 models and we had sand tables and, and did the levels and, on sand tables. Mm. You know, to see how they play out and, did, and play, you know, testing the, you know, what we would now call compulsion loops. But, you know, just the, you know, what was fun and what wasn't and all that. I've just quit smoking and I'm building Lego all the time. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, well, that's what he was doing, except, you know, he's, he was an artist. And, and so he did these incredibly well built model kits, you know, of, of like every piece of weaponry in the game. Wow. Well, you also won script of the year for uh, Soviet strike as well. It must've kind of been a bit of a, revolutionary having one of those storylines in those early PlayStation. Oh games. yeah. And no, and I, and, and I mean, I, I'm still very proud of Soviet strike. You know that, I mean, that was one of the best experiences that I've ever had. That, it, I mean, it was great. It was a great team. The product came out 10 times better than, you know, I thought it would. It's one of those few games that I actually played multiple times after it came out. Mm. I love Soviet strike. So was it quite scary writing the scripts and stuff for Soviet strike? Cause obviously urban strike, jungle strike and desert strike, they actually had, they were quite controversial games for the time, you know, because of the themes and what was happening in the games. Were you worried about any backlash or did it just kind of help project it, you know, further, like make it sell better and stuff? Well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, here's the deal. I mean, you think about my career up to that point. I'm working mm. on Dungeons and Dragons and you got people saying it's satanic. I'm working mm, yeah. on, you know, Night <laughs> Trap. And you got Joe Lieberman waving, you know, the game around. <laughs> I'm working on, you know, uh, something else. He, he waved, oh, uh, I think Double Switch, but there was something else that he decided was going to destroy, you know, destroy people's lives. And so we were just so used to it. And, and frankly, in some ways more controversial than any of that was a game. We skipped this, but it's an interesting little note here. Uh, for the first Gulf War, right, in the yep. 1991 Gulf War, we did a game called, well, I was working with the guys at TSR on a uh, Middle East, you know, simulate combat simulation game. Because remember, at that point, TSR owned um, SBI. And so we had, we were still doing mini, uh, hardcore military games. And mm. more importantly, they had the Tom Clancy license and they did Red Storm Rising and Hunt for Red October. And okay. so we, we and, and George Bush had said, I've drawn a line in the sand. And he actually set a date where if Saddam Hussein didn't get out of Kuwait, we we're going to start bombing. So we knew we had to ship the game on the deadline, by the deadline, right? Yeah. And and so we changed the Middle East uh, uh, simulation game into a Gulf War simulation game and we're play testing it mm. and, and realized, well, if you're the Americans, you know, you don't there's no reason there's no reason to ever go into Iraq until you've just like blown these guys into submission. And, you know, because we had all the real live, you know, yeah. you know, Jane's military stats and everything else. I mean, we had a pretty good idea. We didn't know about F-117s and really all the capability. We didn't know about JDAMs and and the real capabilities of Tomahawks. But we, we had a pretty good idea what, you know, total air superiority w would mean. So we released the game with two sets of rules. One was the realistic set of rules, where if you're the Americans, you just stand off and degrade the Iraqis, you know, for the entire game. Yeah. 
And, and then the other was the, uh, you know, the, the like playable set of rules, which were the Americans had to go in and you actually had to have battles. And the guys at the Air War College thought it was so funny that a bunch of boobs that made video, they made, you know, board games had pretty much figured out what the strategy was. Only because we were play testing and you couldn't have any other strategy if you have real yeah. human lives on the line. So uh, we got invited to the Air War College to speak at, at a uh, convention called Connections. And, and I met, you know, some of the coolest people. I met John Warden, who was the actual strategist for the first Gulf War, who wrote the Air War Doctrine for it. And Jim Dunnigan, who, if you've never read The Quick and Dirty Guide to War, that is that is what Soviet strike, the mentality of it came out of. Mm. And he he designed a lot of games, you know, a lot of uh, military simulation games. There are a bunch of guys, Bruce Shelley who used to go there, uh, Sid Meier go there, you know, I mean, just an incredible collection of people. That was sort of an essential step in it is, you know, designing, you know, hardcore military strategy games, you know, was was very helpful later on. I find it funny that you were kind of pre-predicting it before the uh, generals and stuff. Well, it, it, yeah, it's not like we were geniuses, but I mean, when, when you actually like, you know, simulated it, you just realized, why, why would I ever go into Iraq? I can just bomb these guys. They're sitting in trenches <laughs> and, and, they, and we, we wiped out their air force in the first night. Even in the game, we knew, once again, we didn't know how we were going to do it. And we didn't know that, you know, we'd take them down in 17 minutes, but we knew that we'd do it. You then, after Soviet strike, you worked on nuclear strike. Did you find that like hard kind of, you know, following on from Soviet strike? You know, obviously you won so many awards. It was a release game with the PlayStation. What was that like? Was, you know, was it nerve wracking or was it just, you know, business as usual? No, that's a great question. Um, I remember uh, one night I was, yeah, I was, you know, the phone rang and it it was Rod Swanson, who was the producer on Soviet strike. Mm. And um, he called, uh, you know, he said, um, uh, the, hey, guess what? We have the highest selling game in the world right now. And I said, wow, that's fabulous. And, you know, and they've commissioned the sequel. I said, oh, that's going to be great. We'll have, you know, more money. Because we were, we did Soviet strike. We were chasing around Chris Roberts' wing commander. And and that was, you know, that, you know, that was a very expensive game. And EA, you know, they, it had the impossibly large budget, $10 million. And, and I think EA was gun shy after that. So we were like, <laughs> they were, they were watching our expenditures much more closely. And I figured, yeah, we'll have all the money in the world for a nuclear strike and all that. And Rod said something that was downright prophetic. And he said, we're about to find out that managing success is just as hard as managing failure. And indeed that's what happened. Cause all of a sudden with Soviet strike, you know, I mean, with nuclear strike, all of a sudden every executive, you know, wanted to come in and, you know, have his input and, <laughs> And yeah. everybody, you know, everybody all of a sudden, you know, we were kind of a pretty humble band of uh, game makers in, in Soviet strike and in nuclear strike. You know, the Arbo was a genius and, and, you know, there were a lot of problems and there was, you know, and, and, and so nuclear strike kind of got torqued around. I never really liked a lot of there, you know, and there it's and a new producer came in like towards the end of it and just made a bunch of decisions. I didn't think were really good. And everybody's fighting with each other and. The, the game came out. I mean, I think it was, it was a multi-platinum game, but you notice that EA never made another strike game after that. I was going to say for me, you know, I grew up with those games and when Soviet Strike came out, it was, I saw it everywhere. You know, my older brother was mm-hmm. playing it. My dad was playing it. My dad didn't play video games, but he was playing Soviet Strike. And when Nuclear Strike came out, I didn't, I, I didn't even know it was a game until I was an adult, you know? Yeah. So like you say, even though you had this massive success, with Soviet strike, not to say nuclear strike was a flop or anything like that. It just, I, I, you know, it, it's kind of quietly came out and faded away. Yeah. It, it, and everybody's sort of forgotten it. I, I actually, mm. I think the truth is it outsold Soviet strike. And really? at that moment, I wasn't that happy about it. Mm. Also we had a TV show set up of strike yeah. after Soviet strike. And, and, and something would repeat itself a number of times afterwards. It took so long for, EA to make the deal that, you know, the executive who bought it had left Fox. And so the TV show never happened. LAPD Future Cop became like the the, the future one. Did you have any um, new ideas for the Strike series? If it, I if had it was absolutely continued? nothing to do with any, you know, the, there were a few games that like started out being a strike. I had zero to do with that. Um, we had designed 
a thing, actually Mike Becker much more than me, had designed a thing called Global Strike to go mm. after nuclear strike, and that never happened. Found that design document in my closet too. One thing that I kind of found interesting was you also work with um, AOL and Electronic Arts doing uh, online right. games and stuff. Um, right, yeah, though that was, what? nothing came out of that. Nothing came out of that. No, so. that was just a big... <laughs> that was yeah, okay. You know, we all we're talking about most of what we talk about are games that actually happen. There was an interesting thing to be done about all the projects that didn't happen, which I mostly have amnesia for. But uh, it, this was a very serious, silly period in time where, and you know, it's not that unlike now, but remember, you know, this is a period in the 90s where AOL was a really big deal. Okay. I mean, there's still P, I still have a friend who's got an AOL account. But, it, you know, it was a very big deal. And so it was like, yeah, we'll have AOL and we'll be online and we'll make games and it's going to be great. You know, and there were so many snipe hunts and, and schnook chases and silly things that didn't happen. And that was one of them. I think they actually did do games. But I mean, you know, do you ever, do you ever play an AOL, you know, EA game? I, th- I think the AOL CDs are still around. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, never, I never played any of them. No. Oh, those have got to be collector's items. And, and you know, you got to give it to AOL. I think that is what got, you know, certainly in America, that's what got most Americans onto the Internet because it actually worked. You have written a uh, book, The Game Master. Tell us about that. And uh, where can our listeners get a hold of that? Oh, well, it, it's on Amazon or the our, uh, my publisher sells signed versions of them. Anybody wants to sign one. Uh, it's Rare Bird Books. It's called The Games Master. Not because I think I'm a games master, but that was the title of a G.I. Joe script I wrote. And hmm. I crowdsourced what I should title my book on Facebook. And somebody came up with that and never seemed to like it. So we titled it The Games Master, which is a fitting title from the point of view that uh, it, I mean, th- that book is about four years of my life. That's from 1983, okay, you know, pretty much you know, just getting out of film school to 1987. Uh, you know, the last little thing of it was was getting hired by Stephen to do uh, t- what would grow up to be Tiny Toons. Um, and it was it, it has all the Gary Gygax stories, Transformer stories, G.I. Joe stories, um, uh, and and just and it's just about that period, you know, where I just ran into these extraordinary people, and 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 cool things happen. I mean, I was working with George Lucas and Jack Kirby, and and I guess Stan Lee was after that. He's not in the book that that came later. But the point the point is is that you know it's just a really exciting period, and 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 it's some that so many conventions I was asked questions about it. I decided I'm just going to write a book about this. And I discovered I had 150 pages of interview question answers already in a Google Doc. And so uh, and I was sitting in an apartment. Uh, it was just in like uh, 2016. And I was sitting in an apartment in Paris and we had our new game. I was at Niantic at that point. Our new game was coming out. And it was kind of like if it, if it did well, you know, we just spun out of Google. You know, if it did well, then you know, our company would still be around. If it didn't, I'd have to figure out what was next, you know, that was Pokemon go. So it did well, but, um, Mm. uh, but that's when I started writing the book and then I finished it right before COVID. The last meeting I had before COVID was with my editor on games master. Good timing that you got it in there. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well that was the whole thing. I mean, it's like, there's a lot, I I wish I, I wish I'd had another pass at it, Mm. but at that moment I just wanted to get it done before the world ended. (laughs) And uh, kind of the final question, wh- what are you involved with nowadays then? What, what are you up to at the moment? Oh, well, I am. I, all right, I can't tell you anything about it, but the announcement was last week. Um, I'm in a company called Deviation. Oh, okay, so it's E3. Uh, <laughs> what? So maybe it was e- something at E3. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that is, uh, you know, that yeah, that is what I'm doing right now. And it, it is... I've certainly never worked on a cooler or more ambitious project, but I can't, I can't say anything else. I'd like, you know, we're NDA and, you know, they have, you know, hit squads that come out if you talk about it. So, um, I mean, these guys have made black ops and zombies, right? Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. And, uh, and then, and I, I designed uh, the first role playing game that I designed over COVID. I had a bunch of stuff that I was working on over COVID, that uh you know is is sort of coming to life um did a uh, uh I, I had a thing called there's a show i worked on at sunbow called uh inhumanoids and ever after inhumanoids i wanted to do something you know set under the earth right 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we got Subterraliens premiered at GaryCon. And uh, a guy named Jay Parker was a great designer. He works with uh, Telsorian a lot, but he's, you know, he's just a really great designer. You know, was taking my incoherent ideas and intentions and turning them into a real game design. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm doing my first RPG in a long time, working with uh, Chris Metzen and, uh, you know, who was at you know, Blizzard, you know, which is the guy behind really Warcraft, Starcraft. Overwatch, Diablo. I he and I did Diablo together, and then wrote a uh, series of of Transformer graphic novels. Um, and so we're we're cooking up some stuff uh, with with him and George Christic. You know, we're just, I mean, and this is just kind of like fun stuff we're doing. You know, because it was COVID, so we you know we had a lot of time on our hands. Well, I'm glad you've kind of made good use of it. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Flint. Yeah, that was great, absolutely rampacked and amazing, mate.